In this video, we're going to be talking about the new refrigerants that are coming to the market in the end of 2024, beginning of 2025 in North America. Specifically, we're talking about R32 and R454B. We're going to be talking specifically about what makes these refrigerants differently, what you can expect, whether or not you should wait to get equipment if you're on the fence about getting equipment now. There's a lot of misinformation about these refrigerants, as well as what's going to happen with the existing refrigerants that are currently in phase, specifically R410A, which is widely used by all manufacturers in North America. And we're going to talk about what's going to happen to equipment that maybe just got installed that had 410A in it. And when that 410A phase out schedule is actually going to take place and spoiler alert, it's going to be a while, but we'll, we'll tell you about that in this video and more. But before we get started, if you haven't done so already, please make sure you smash that like button for the algorithm and consider subscribing to the channel if you haven't done so already. We put out daily and weekly content on how you can get the best HVAC for your home. So if you're in the market for HVAC system replacement and want to know how to get the best HVAC for your home, primarily what we talk about on this channel. And in this video, like I said, we're going to be talking about specifically the new refrigerants that are coming to the market at the end of this year and beginning of 2025. Now, first off, let's talk about the two different refrigerants and what actually makes them different. Now, R32 is one of the refrigerants that's coming to North America, and another one is R454B. These are designed to replace R410A, which has been in existence and use for the past 20 years. Now, if you're asking why are these refrigerants suddenly being phased out, out. The reason they're being phased out is because the quote unquote GWP, which is a rating that's giving to a refrigerant, which stands for global warming potential, as well as ODP, which is a rating that's giving to a refrigerant, P, which stands for ozone depletion potential. Those, and I just put that in quotation marks because it's a number that is created by the manufacturers. It's really hard to gauge, at least in, in my opinion. From what I've read, they've actually changed. If you look at the history of any of the refrigerants that have come out, they actually adjust the GWPs up and down. It's just a rating scale scale given to a particular refrigerant. And 410A, although it has a zero ODP, or the GWP is actually much higher. And what it means, to give you an example, let's say a refrigerant, a GWP of 100, that would mean that one pound of refrigerant is equivalent to the impact of 100 pounds of carbon in the atmosphere. Now, the main motivation behind this, or it, this all has to do with legislation and the EPA, phasing out refrigerants that have a GWP above 750. So R410A has a GWP of over 2000, which means that it is going to be phased out eventually, but that's actually not going to happen until about 2040. So 2037 is the end of the phase down schedule. And then basically in 2040 is my understanding of when it's completely phased out in terms of production. Up until then, you're they're no longer manufacturing, so you won't be able to buy 410A equipment in 2025. But in terms of being able to get refrigerant or parts or things to service your existing equipment, that will still be available into the coming years. So that's not really a concern. That's the big benefit. If you you ask me and you want my honest opinion, I honestly, it kind of sounds like planned obsolescence to me, which is kind of like, you know, when Apple updates the iPhone and suddenly that software update just made your phone so unbearably slow that you had to go out and buy a new one. So this kind of feels a little bit like that to me. We are technically going to get some efficiency gains, which I'll we'll talk about in a second, but that's just my opinion is it, it kind of strikes me as planned obsolescence in terms of a phase out by the EPA. Now, as far as R32 and R454B and what the difference is, R32 is going to be offered by Daikin, Amana, and Goodman as their, that's going to be the refrigerant they use, while a lot of other manufacturers are going to be using 454B. Now, R32 is a single product. It is not a blend, whereas 454B is actually a blended refrigerant. And what that means is it's a combination of other refrigerants. And what that translates to from a service perspective in terms of how it affects you is that when you have an R32 system, you'll actually be able to top off the refrigerant. So if it's a little low on refrigerant, let's say by a pound or something because it lost a refrigerant and it just leaked some out or it was a little short, you could top that off with a system that uses R454B. You technically have to recover all the refrigerant and then recharge the system with that. Now, the truth is, is that was supposed to be the protocol for R410A because that is technically a blended refrigerant as well. And if you talk to any technician out there, I don't know of a single technician that doesn't just top off R410A. So we'll see how that actually comes into play in the field. You know, if we're having chronic issues with the system, we might not top it off and might recover and recharge fresh virgin refrigerant, but that's kind of rare. That would then fix it unless there was something else. The reason is, is because if your refrigerant is not going to have the same properties and function the same way as if it was the proper blended ratio, where if it's like, you know, 70, 30 versus 60, 40 of the refrigerants that make it up, it's going to function a little bit differently and it's going to affect how it performs. And so that's one of the, you know, potential benefits of R32 is that it's not a blended refrigerant, but both these refrigerants, one of the things that that one of the pieces of 
information is that they are actually flammable. Now, they are mildly flammable, and what that means or how that's designed in terms of the classification for these refrigerants, which is they are classified as an A2L refrigerant. What that means is that they will only ignite if an ignition source is applied. So that means if you hold your barbecue lighter up and you let it rip and just let that R32 out, it might ignite. And then when it does ignite, if it's burning, as soon as you turn off your barbecue lighter and remove the flame, it's going to extinguish. So it needs an external source for it to ignite. That's why it's mildly flammable by comparison with some of the, you know, natural refrigerants, which is things like propane and butane, which are highly flammable. Whereas if you set that on fire, it is not going to stop. It is a combustible, you know, or flammable material. And so it is going to be a much bigger fire hazard than something like R32 or R454B. If you're curious, there's a few videos on the internet. I don't have any of these videos, but if you just Google R32 flammability, you can see some videos of how it performs. And it, bottom line is it's not that flammable. It's not the biggest concern that I have in terms of installing these systems in a home because it is still classed as an A2L refrigerant and it's still classed as mildly flammable. So it's not really that big of a deal. It is definitely more of an occupational hazard to the technicians that are working than it is to you, but just it being in your system, if it leaked out all the refrigerant into your home, it's not like that's gonna just catch on fire because you've got a refrigerant leak. So that's not something I would worry about. Now, one of the benefits of R32 by comparison with 410A, as well as 454B, is that the system takes a lower charge. And so in order to get the same efficiencies, if you look at equipment over the past 20 years, it's consistently in order to get more efficient, it's gotten bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger in order to maximize efficiency. Because part of what makes a system more efficient is that you have a larger surface area. And so it's, it's just better at removing heat from the refrigerant with either a lower amp draw compressor or a fan motor that's doing less work. So if you look at any of these big variable speed systems, some of them are massive. For example, even some of the single stage systems, if you look at the Daikin DZ5 is a heat pump that is a single stage system, but all those single stage, you know, 15 CR2 systems, they are huge. They have a massive footprint. We always have a problem getting them in and out of our vans to where we have to put them in the side compartment of the door for, or the side slider versus putting them in the back. Well, one of the benefits for the newer R32 equipment is going to be a smaller physical footprint. So the installation space required for an R32 unit, it will take up less space. So if you're already in a position where you have a design system constraints that where you live in the city, you have very tight lot lines and you just don't have a lot of space for your condenser, that might be a benefit to you. But honestly, right now, if you just put in something like a Daikin Fit or any of the side discharge products that are on the market, because all of the manufacturers actually have a side discharge product that, you know, vents out the side, those particular systems are going to do well in those areas where you have those sizing constraints as well anyway. So there's still options available now, but if you'd like to wait to see some of these smaller systems come onto the market, that will be an added benefit, mostly for installers, just because we're going to be working with smaller equipment, which is a little bit easier on the back. But besides that, it is a going to be a nice upgrade because you won't need quite as much space. Now I'm going to wrap up talking about R290 and some other refrigerants that will be coming to North America eventually. And we'll, we'll touch on that. But before we do that, if you haven't done so already, please make sure you smash that like button and subscribe to the channel if you haven't done so already, because it's a huge help. Again, really helps us out with the algorithm and really helps us continue to grow the channel. That being said, one of the most common questions I get asked is when people watch some of the videos on our channel and they hear us talk about other refrigerants or natural refrigerants, things like R290, which is a heat pump or in a lot of heat pumps overseas that are used in what's called monoblock technology, which means all the refrigerant is contained outside in the condenser and doesn't actually go inside to the indoor evaporator coil. People have asked me, when is this refrigerant coming to North America? Now, technically it's already here. It's just in more commercial applications like walk-in coolers and things of that nature. You're not gonna see it in commercial, but currently the way that the law reads or in North America, there's a limit to the amount of 500 grams of charge. That basically renders these systems such that we can't really import them. That's my understanding of it because I've reached out to, you know, we get a lot of interest in these particular systems. And so I've reached out to manufacturers and asked them about, hey, are you guys bringing, you know, the R290 air to water heat pumps that you have in Europe and Japan and, you know, other parts of the world? Are you bringing those to North America anytime soon? And the response that I've gotten from all the manufacturers on multiple occasions is eventually, maybe, we don't know when because some things have to change with the regulations in order for that to happen, but it's not happening, you know, next year, most likely. You can bet I will definitely keep you updated when that does happen because obviously I'm just as eager to install some of this newer technology and tell you guys what I think. And, I'll, and do head-to-head -head comparison
comparisons between the R32 systems, the 410A systems that are out now, as well as these R290 systems. And one more thing I kind of want to touch on is one of the other differences about these refrigerants that I may have alluded to but not gone into deeper is the fact that R32, even though it's a new refrigerant in the United States, one of the benefits is that this is not a new refrigerant by any means. It's already in over a billion units uh, globally. So it's been battle tested in the field and it's been used for years. I want to say it's been used for close to 10 years at this point in Europe and overseas in other markets. And so it's proven itself as an efficient refrigerant. You don't have to worry about being a guinea pig with new technology or a new refrigerant. Sometimes like how manufacturers, when they come out with a new car, people will say, hey, don't buy the first year of a new model or a new car be until they work out the kinks with, you know, what might go bad with the transmission or the engine or whatnot. You don't have to worry about that with R32 because it is not a new refrigerant by any means. It's been battle tested in the field and they kind of know what to expect and have fine tuned and tweaked the systems over the years. The same is not true for 454B. 454B has done more lab testing. So it's still, they've done a lot of lab testing on the refrigerant. So I can't speak to much more to the extent because I actually haven't seen the reports and the extent of the testing. But the bottom line is it had its functions in a very similar way to the how 410A functions. It just has a much lower GWP and therefore meets those requirements. So there is still a benefit to going with that. It hasn't, you know, been used in the field like R32 has. And so that will be a newer refrigerant. Either way, if you're buying from a reputable company with a good warranty, it's not something I would worry about too much, but that is something to consider. And it, in my opinion, is one of the things that gives R32 a leg up by comparison with systems that are going to be using 454B. So hopefully you found this content helpful. And if you happen to be in the market for HVAC system replacement, or if you just recently moved and you need a permanent HVAC company to take care of your regular maintenance and service, click the link in the description below to be connected with a local contractor in your area. We've actually teamed up with a handpicked group of contractors nationwide that maintain the highest customer service ratings on Google, as well as technical excellence. So if you've watched this show and you thought, wow, I'd really like to work with these guys, but it's too bad that they only service a few select areas, I feel you. And that's why we've decided to partner with the best local contractors nationwide in your area, some of which have even been featured on our show. This way, you can find a contractor that's familiar with the latest technology, whether that's cold weather heat pumps or inverter driven heat pumps that work well on battery backup or solar or in-floor radiant heat or any other technology that's specific to your climate or your region. We're partnering with those contractors. So click the link in the description to request an appointment with us or with a vetted HVAC Dope Show contractor in your area. And right now, there's a few videos popping up on the screen that YouTube thinks you should watch. So make sure you check those out if you haven't done so already, and we will catch you on the next episode.